There are hundreds of interesting locations in Fallout 4, but there are even more unmarked locations that we can't fast travel to that are not part of any quest. This is episode 2 in my series exploring all of these unmarked or minor locations in Fallout 4. First, we'll head on over to Mean Pastries. We find Mean Pastries just west of Pickman's Gallery. Leave Pickman's Gallery and go out a gate to the west, then head up a stairway and through an alley to the south. This brings us to the North End Graveyard. We explored this when I did my video on Shem Drown. And after clearing the ghouls from the North End Graveyard, simply turn south. We see a big Joe Spucky's billboard on a nearby building and some colorful flags. And jumping over this barricade, we do see a green door, but it leads to a shop called Mean Pastries, not Joe's Spuckies, strangely enough. And there's no sign outside identifying this shop. We only know it's called Mean Pastries because of the door. There is an alleyway going around this building, and in the back, we find another green door to Mean Pastries. But let's go through the front door for now. We find ourselves in a small room, dimly lit by only one table-mounted construction light. We see a cat sitting on a rubbish pile on the customer side of the bakery counter. Since I tend to upset my viewers if I kill cats in my videos, we'll go ahead and leave this guy alone. We see a few skeletons lying face down on the customer side, and the bell by the cash register still works. We can loot some caps and pre-war money from the cash register, and we see a few sweet rolls still sitting out. Rounding the bakery counter, we see a skeleton lying on the ground with two sweet rolls by its hands. We can go behind the counter to the employee section. We don't really find anything here, just broken dishware, cutlery, and more sweet rolls. We do find another skeleton on the ground, but when we head to the register, we see a floor-mounted safe behind the counter locked with an expert lock. Back out from behind the counter, we can try our luck at getting a perfectly preserved pie from the Porta Diner here. As always, I feel miserably. And we see one more skeleton on the ground. And that's it for Mean Pastries. We can leave through the back door, which just brings us to the alleyway behind. We sadly don't know much of a story about this place. To my knowledge, it's not based on any real-life location, though there are a number of pastry shops in the north end of Boston. It could be a reference to any of them. My big question is how this cat has survived. I'm assuming it can't open and close doors. Has it been here for 200 years? Is it a ghoul cat? Or is it the offspring of a cat that was locked in here the day the bombs dropped? and has lived by eating old sweet rolls. We may never know. The next location is northeast of Bunker Hill. To find it, we can walk to the ruined Weatherby Savings and Loan Building, the one that houses the USS Constitution, and then take the road north. This takes us across a bridge. We have to hop over a ruined truck, and then turning the corner, we run smack dab into a random encounter. You must be This random encounter takes place in the middle of the road, right outside a red door to a drug lab. The drug lab is inside a partially ruined apartment complex, and we can hear a raider talking to him or herself somewhere nearby. There's a big broken hole in the side of the building, but the raider's not here, so instead we can open the door to the drug den. We arrive in a foyer. The walls are covered in torn and rotting posters from a bygone era. There's a door to the east, but it's blocked up by a sofa, so instead we continue by creeping through a hole in the nearby wall. As we listen, we hear the sound of raiders taking chems. 
This bottom floor may at one time have been a magazine shop, a pharmacy maybe, a chemist, a hardware store. We don't really know, but there are some magazine and tool racks. Oddly positioned in this room, we find two doses of Psycho on a countertop, one piece of Jet on a magazine rack, and an odd assortment of scrappin' toys on a tool shelf. As we approach the stairway, we hear raiders expressing their insecurities. This isn't anything like training. Shooting at plywood. How's that supposed to get me ready for this hell? Creeping up the stairs, we find a raider taking chems. Ah, oh, I found you! Oh. 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 Wipe in the floor with ya. Whoa, whoa. Oh. Hear that? Oh. Oh. You know how to show a girl a good time. After killing his friend that came downstairs, we can loot the bodies before heading upstairs to the final floor. Up here, we see a small bedroom. There are two doses of jet by a barrel that the raiders had turned over, built a fire inside, and are using as a grill. There's a first aid box next to a mattress on the ground, and a bottle cap mine next to an end of dungeon steamer trunk. To leave, we can open a red door to the east, to Charleston. This brings us to a big broken room at the top of the apartment complex, and here we meet the owner of the voice we heard from the road. We woke up a raider who had been sleeping on this sleeping bag. We end on a rooftop overlooking the Charleston area, and we can see Bunker Hill in the distance. The next location is the Cambridge construction site. It's really close to the drug den, which we just explored. To find it, head to the BADTFL regional office. We go here for a number of reasons, one of which is to find a tape on Eddie Winter. After clearing the raiders, we see the construction site due south. As we approach, we see swinging super mutant meat bags. This tells us what we are to expect. And near to the construction site is a door that leads to the construction site warehouse. The warehouse is pretty small. We see a bulldozer lying here and a meat bag hanging from the ceiling. Gotta be a good fight! Something's ghosting us. But before we can go up and kill him, Kate takes care of him. Girl, a good time. There's a cash register and a desk to the southwest. And heading up the stairs, we can cross the loft to the eastern part of the building. Here we can get some meat and loot some beer from inside an enamel bucket. And that's it for this tiny little warehouse. To leave, we can go out the southwestern door. This brings us to a road near to another bulldozer and a super mutant. More super mutants from the nearby construction site attack. And then Kate goes crazy. Now there are a few ways to enter this construction site, but here I am on my big guns character wearing a full suit of power armor, so I'm just gonna run through the front door guns blazing. There's a small moat around the construction site, but we can climb up a plywood ramp up the stairs and enter through the front door. After destroying a machine gun turret, we can explore the rooms on this ground floor, but we don't really find much. There is an elevator door, but it leads to an empty elevator shaft. The elevator had not yet been installed into this building. So instead, we can climb the stairs to deal with another super mutant. There are plenty more rooms to explore back here. Lots of opportunities for stealth. Coming back around to the lobby near to the stairway, we can kill another super mutant. And then race up the stairs. On this level, we find some meat bags, and we see that the floor above is collapsing into this one, creating a rubble ramp leading up. Here, we find a weapons workbench and another rubble ramp leading to the next floor. But as we scale this building, the floors become more and more destroyed. We now cross a plywood ramp going from support girder to support girder until we climb another rubble ramp to the next floor, cross a girder, and then take the stairs to the top. At the very top, we find an end of dungeon steamer trunk, right next to a campfire and a barber chair, where the boss super mutant sat, but we killed him with our fat man. The only quest that brings us here is the weather vane quests from Tinker Tom at the railroad. He wants us to come here to set up one of his Mila devices. We don't find any more paths up, 
but if we have a jetpack, we can use it to leap up to the final platform here. From the top of the construction site, we see a beautiful view of downtown and of the freeway that cuts through the heart of the city. We see a ramp that connects this Cambridge construction site to the freeway, so from here we could go and explore the freeway and the nearby super mutant infested skyscrapers, or we can take the empty elevator shaft to the ground. We land in a flooded basement. There is a door leading to a back room here where we find a second end of dungeon steamer trunk. We can then unchain a nearby door to climb some stairs out of the basement. And finally, we can explore an adjacent parking garage wherein we only find a weapons workbench. The super mutants are scattered all over this construction site. We often find some lingering around in the streets outside of it. Gotta be Near to this guy cooking in a pot is an interesting scene. We see a couple of target dummies set up to an old statue pedestal. And around the base, someone has left flowers. It's kind of odd. Now there is one more way to access this construction site, which may be useful for more stealthy builds. If approaching from the southeast, near to that crashed burning vertebrate, we can climb a rubble ramp formed from an adjacent building to reach its rooftop. Here we find a girder forming a ramp that goes directly into a hole in the wall of the construction site. This leaves two or three floors that we don't have to climb, making it easier to get to the top where we find the chest. Our next location is due south of Backstreet Apparel. If we head to the street on the southern side of Backstreet Apparel, we pass a skeleton awkwardly positioned on a ladder until we find a pre-war bank. As we get closer, we learn that this bank was called Bridgeway Trust. The inside of the bank is completely dark, lit only by the moonlight that comes in through the windows. We see thick dust floating in this room. We can start by exploring a bathroom to the west, but there's nothing here. There's a skeleton on the ground next to a toppled over magazine stand. Another skeleton on the ground next to a destroyed police protectron, which we can't loot. Facing west, we see explosive char marks on the ground next to some bodies. There are bullet holes and explosion marks on the ground and on the bank counter. All of the pre-war skeletons littering the ground leads me to believe that we've stumbled upon a pre-war bank robbery in progress. There's a 10 millimeter pistol lying near to one of these skeletons. These two skeletons at the front may be the male and female remains of the bank robbers who may have been killed by the police protectron. Maybe they were doing a Bonnie and Clyde sort of thing, or a Vicky and Vance sort of thing. Heading into one of the cubicles, we see a skeleton in a chair, and ooh, a grizzly scene behind the desk. We see a bullet hole in the wall directly above a bloody smear leading to a human skeleton. One of these bank robbers must have shot this clerk in the head, whereupon his body slid down the wall to the ground. To go behind the counter, we can go through a southeastern door. This is almost entirely blocked up, but we do find a door that leads behind the counter. Here we find even more skeletons and more evidence of a violent robbery. There's a bloody smear on the concrete behind this woman's head. We can loot some pre-war money from the bank counter and from many of the cash registers. And this is odd. The door to the bank vault is installed backwards. We see the big locking bars on this side of the vault, but that would prove to be a huge security risk. Someone made a big mistake. To open the door, we can access a master locked terminal right next to it. And once we open it, we can enjoy an animation that we otherwise wouldn't be able to see because it takes place on the other side of the door. The bank vault door reveals a whole bunch of safes on the wall and they're all locked out oh, now. These safes range in difficulty from novice all the way to master. And there's no key, there's no shortcut. If we want the loot, we have to pick each and every one of these. But you know what? I'm gonna consider this a blessing because hey, at least we can walk away with a whole bunch of experience from unlocking each of these wall safes. After finally unlocking all 12 of them, we walk away with a tidy stash of caps and ammunition. We can loot more pre-war money on a shelf, four gold bars right next to it. And oh no, what's this? 
More wall safes. Another six to the right of this shelf. Oh, we can unlock each of these one by one, but hey, it's more experience. As we're about to leave, we see one more crouching down behind the shelf. Ah, oh, but thankfully, it's already unlocked. And with that, we succeed where the bank robbers 200 years ago failed, and we completely loot this pre-war vault. This next location is also close to Backstreet Apparel. We find it almost directly southeast of it. If we follow the road east from Backstreet Apparel, we stumble upon a wrecked building with a light inside. It's hard to read the sign at night, but turning on our torch, Anna's Cafe. But we hear the sound of raiders nearby, and as we move around in our power armor, we alert them, so we're gonna have to be sneaky. We can open a Neato Tronic on the wall next to this thing, but there's nothing inside. We find two pre-war skeletons lounging in picnic chairs on the patio. They must have been enjoying a nice breakfast when the bombs dropped. Inside, we see candles inexplicably still lit. There's an espresso machine to the west, and heading around behind the counter, we see a sleeping bag where raiders must have been napping, and a first aid kit. On top of the counter is one Nuka-Cola. We can loot some sugar bombs, but this isn't Fallout 3, so I'm gonna pass it for now, and then loot a cash register on the countertop. The raiders must be upstairs, so climbing the stairs, we arrive on the second floor, but nothing is here. Where are these raiders? We can precariously walk across the ruined floor to the southwest and then turn on our light. Lying dead by her bed is likely the corpse of Anna herself, the proprietor of this cafe. It looks like she may have gotten drunk and committed suicide. There are empty beer bottles scattered around her feet and a 10 millimeter pistol by her hand. And it looks like she may have done herself in while gazing at the memory of the only thing she ever loved. A framed desktop photograph of her pet cat. On her desk is a teddy bear with a cigar. But since little Marie has long grown up by the time of Fallout 4, I'll go ahead and leave this here. But where are those raiders? Well, we don't see them here. Though we do see a hole in the roof, but no stairway leading up. So using our jetpack, we can hop on up, but there's really nothing up here. Hopping on up to the rooftop, we find a skeleton to the west. This time, a man slumped against some crates with a stim pack on a crate near his head and some giddy-up buttercup parts lying beside him. Here, we can walk away with a purified water and a dose of Psycho. But again, no raiders. So where are these guys? Well, the raiders we've been hearing are actually in a nearby raider back alley camp. To find this next unmarked location, we can head to the eastern side of this rooftop. Looking down into the street, we do see a door leading into this building, but it looks like we can leap right over the roof. Doing so and creeping to the edge, we find the raiders. And they find us. Talk about overkill. <laughs> Well, let's explore this raider back alley camp the way it was intended. Jumping down to the road, we can open the door to the northeast, which leads us inside an old abandoned kitchen. Our mini nukes have really done their work. Loot a dismembered raider. Looks like the living room was right next to the kitchen in this little house. But we don't find much loot. Heading out the back door leads to an alleyway where we can loot another raider and we see a trap that we must have triggered with our explosion. The tripwire is gone, but it was attached to a gun trap mounted behind some sandbag barricades. At the top of the stairs, we find the main raider hangout. This is where they lounged around and cooked their food on the nearby grill. We can unlock a novice locked explosives box on top of the picnic table and then loot a nearby lunch pail. After looting the final raider, we see another path out of here. There's an alleyway to the south and we can disarm a bathroom scale pressure trap. This was again attached to a gun trap erected behind a cinder block. This alleyway leads right to Diamond City, so it's really close to the Great Green Jewel. I wonder why the Diamond City guards have never cleared out these raiders. Our next location is called the East CIT Raider Camp. 
To find this, we head across the bridge north of Backstreet Apparel. This leads us towards the ruins of CIT. On the other side, if we follow the road north, we see fire glowing in barrels next to a scrap wall. This is the entrance to the East CIT Raider Camp. Now we could open this large gate in the front, but that's what they want us to do. So instead we're gonna sneak around. We see that the Raiders have a relaxation area over here, some chairs and a TV underneath a canopy. The first time we'll find this is often while having a conversation with Father on the rooftop of CIT. We see it clearly during that conversation. We don't find a back entrance until we walk to the northeast. Here, we find an unlocked door in the scrap wall. And peering inside, we find the Raiders. The raiders had fortified and were protecting this courtyard. There is a red door leading to an office building, but we'll check this out in a minute. Heading around the rooftop corner, we can loot an ammo box sitting on some barrels on the far side, and we see a sky bridge connecting this building with the next. We likely reach that by going through the red door, so we'll skip that for now. Heading back down the scaffolding, we can take it all the way to the other side of the courtyard, where two more raiders, one of whom is legendary, charge us from the scaffolding. There's not much over here. We don't find any doors or major containers. There is a cooking station. And from here, we can access another raider guard post. At the end of this ramp is another ammo box. We can open a white door to the east. This just brings us back out to the road. So, looting the remaining raider corpses, we can head back up the scaffolding ramp and open the red door to the office building. Immediately upon entry, we find more raiders. Hold up. I was just getting wormed up. We see an elevator to the east. Lots of rubble to the northwest. And then another raider attacks from behind. The jet will be jittery. My goodness, that means this guy came in through the same door we did. There must be a bunch more outside that followed us in. In addition to the elevator, we see a door to the east leading to Cambridge with a big red exit sign on top. But first, I want to see what's on the other side of this elevator. Heading inside and opening the hatch, we see that we're already on the top floor. Okay, so this is going to go down. Punching the button and waiting until the doors open on the other side, we can kill a final raider. End of the line! A big trash pile forms a ramp to a platform up here where we just find a lantern. Really nothing of value. We can leave through a southern door back out to Cambridge. And as soon as we do, machine gun turret! We find ourselves beneath that sky bridge we saw from the rooftop earlier. And bodies hang from the sky bridge. Raiders marking their territory. We can open a blue Pulowski preservation shelter here, but there's nothing inside. We see that the raider fortifications continue to the east. Climbing some stairs, we don't see anything on this platform, but we do find a raider gate at the end of a ramp to the south. Opening it leads us almost right to the water. We can clearly see green tech genetics nearby. Heading back inside and turning southeast, we find a ruined Corvega as part of a rubble ramp leading to a broken floor in an adjacent building, but there's nothing on this level. So I wonder why this is here. We can pass some food cooking on a spit to climb some stairs to the northwest where we find another ammunition box. And we see that we're by that gate, that first gate that we saw upon arriving. There is that raider relaxation spot beneath the canopy. But that's about all that's out here. Now, I really want to see what's on the other side of that sky bridge, so heading back into the office building, we can take the elevator back upstairs and then exit through the door to the south. We arrive on the sky bridge, decorated by severed hanging heads. Heading across the bridge, we can go through a door to the room on the other side where we find the final raider. Oh, but I ran out of ammo! Oh, thanks, Kate. 
There is an ammo box on the ground next to this bed. We can loot a chem box on a shelf next to a chemistry station. And on the northern end of this room, we find an end of dungeon steamer trunk. To leave, we head out of the small room and drop down a hole in the floor. This leads to that wrecked room accessed by the rubble ramp we saw earlier. So that was its purpose. And with that, we fully explore the East CIT Raider Camp. Next up, we need to head to Lexington. After destroying the super mutant behemoth and the ghouls that inevitably attack, we can head southwest of the Super Duper Mart and walk around the Slocum's Joe. Directly next to it is an unmarked location called Fading Glory Laundromat. To enter, we open the white door to the laundromat. Inside is dark, and for some reason, Kate thinks it's a great spot to cuddle. Good. We can finally have a moment to ourselves. We can loot an overdue book on a table here, and then all we find are a bunch of washers and dryers. We can loot each of these for randomized loot. We see the skeleton of a woman slumped down next to a dryer. There's another stack of eight dryers in the middle of the laundromat, and in one, we find a complete human skeleton. All left hand bones, all left arm bones, all right hand bones, all right arm bones. Not to mention the torso, ribcage, spine, and skull. How can we explain this? Well, I can think of only two options. A, this is a murder scene, and someone used a dryer to try and dispose of this body. Or B, as the bombs dropped, somebody jumped inside this dryer to shield themselves from the nuclear fallout. But as we see... It didn't work. Turning west, we find an employee bathroom with some minor containers and a first aid kit on the wall. And finally to the north, we find a skeleton slumped over on some chairs, clutching a bottle of whiskey. This, I think, lends credence to the idea that the bones are in that dryer because someone was using it for shelter. I doubt very much that this guy would be drinking in despair in his final moments, watching a murderer stuff a corpse into a dryer. It sounds much more likely that he would be doing so while people around him panicked. To leave, we can open a metal door to the south, and this puts us out in an alleyway dining area right behind Slocum's Joe, where we find more skeletons, including one woman splayed out awkwardly on a picnic table. Next up is the Garage Alcove. We find this place while exploring the MedTech Research Facility. We only come here to complete MacReady's Companion Quest, so it may be one of those locations that fewer people ever visit. Now, MedTech is infested with ghouls, and they likely all charge us as we arrive, including the ghouls that were in the nearby garage. But after they're dealt with, we can finally explore this garage. Heading inside, we see a small alcove to the west, and here we see that some sorry wastelander had tried to set up a camp or maybe even a permanent home. Not judging just how dangerous this area was, we see toys and scrap, a functional weapons workbench next to a barrel of wood on fire, and on the ground next to her sleeping bag is the corpse of a settler. Had we not disturbed the ghouls upon entry, we would have found ghouls crouched over her body, feeding. She really thought she could have made this a home. She has a chair and a circle rug and has even brought her childhood teddy bear, which she rested at the foot of her bed. Heading up the ramp to the top of this garage, we find a small abandoned raider camp with a cooking stove beneath a raider canopy held upright by cinder blocks. And to the southwest, we find two ghoul corpses next to an ammo crate. We would normally find another wastelander corpse here, but for some reason in my game it had disappeared. Maybe because I triggered it to spawn a long time ago and it decomposed. There are two more final points of interest. If we head to the Old North Church, we see a big statue in the courtyard out front. Depicted on the statue is none other than Paul Revere, atop his horse, the same horse he used in his midnight ride. Paul Revere is famous for warning the Americans that the British were coming. We bypass his statue on our way to the final location on the Freedom Trail, none other than the Old North Church. But if we follow the Freedom Trail back a little bit, we find an old gray building decorated with patriotic banners. This was the original home 
of Paul Revere. It's half intact after all of this time, but we still see its doorway. Creeping forward, we see its spot on the Freedom Trail, and on a wall above it is a plaque, Paul Revere's house. Built in 1680, this wooden building is the oldest structure in all of Boston. In 1770, this home was bought by famed patriot Paul Revere. Paul Revere dwelt here with his family, including his 16 children, until 1800. Paul Revere was living here when he made his famous midnight ride to Lexington and Concord to warn Samuel Adams and John Hancock that Redcoats were en route to arrest them and seize the militia weaponry. Heading inside, we see what a feat it must have been to raise 16 kids in this tiny little house. Sure, it's multiple stories, but still, it's a tiny home. The stairway is gone, so we have to have a jetpack to reach the second floor. We just find one desk, no big reward for getting up there, and then we can use a jetpack to reach the attic, but there's nothing in the attic. Sadly, Paul Revere's house is mostly destroyed, but at least the plaque still remains. And with that, we complete episode two of Unmarked Locations in Fallout 4. What are some others that you would love to see me cover in future episodes? Let me know in the comments section below. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter to keep up to date with all Oxhorn news. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.